Okay. If you're recording it, Dave, do I get extra payment for that? Uh, no. Ah. Okay, if you want uh, extra misery in the day, here we go. <laughs> I'll give you a quick resume about my CV. Right? Farming, born and bred on both sides of the family. And quite a few uncles and aunts, obviously. And I was one of three sons and I was the middle one. So the eldest son would inherit the farm. And uh, we couldn't very well work together because we only had two speeds and that was slow and stop. So you had to make your way in life. So uh, when I was about 17, I went and joined a farmer's relief service covering uh, the south of England. I had gone to Guess the Isle for a year and good job I did because that's where I met my wife. And I used to go to the church regular on a Sunday because she was there. Mm. And when she got up, we put the Bibles underneath. So when she sat down, she'd make a noise and the vicar then would be looking to see what the problem was. But they were happy days. After that, after the relief service, I went to college for a year. It was a two-year course. But I left after the first year. And that's another story. So we'll skip on. And then I joined a poultry processing company called Eastwood in 1970. I done a month's training as a quality control officer, which was new to the industry. Max and Spencer's were the leaders, and I think they still are for quality and hygiene. And I spent 10 years at Eastwood. I was a year on the quality control. Then the under manager left, so I took over his job. And then, uh, unfortunately, my manager, Johnny Johnson, was a nice boy. He had stomach cancer, and he was unwell for about six months before he passed away. So I was made manager then. And we were processing 130,000 birds a week. They were seven and a half weeks old with an average weight of just under four pounds. So you learned a lot. And I'll get on to the food side in a minute, because I think people don't realize or don't take enough interest what they're eating or what's in it. So I'll, we'll go along those lines after. When I was in Eastwoods, the summer, with a lot of holidays, we used to take in a lot of students. And some of them, well, they shouldn't have gone there because it's not everybody's cut a cup of tea to work in a processing plant. And if you remember, I think it was in 75, 76, when we had the power cuts, because the birds were still growing, you had to kill about 130,000 a week. Because every couple of days, the birds would be putting on weight every day. And if you weren't careful, they wouldn't fit the shackles and the, and the system as it was. So we were working two shifts, six, six in the morning to 10 in the morning, and four till eight in the afternoon. The staff and the employees were marvelous, where everybody pulled together to keep the job going and to keep themselves in work. So about 1976, well, any questions on that first? Mike, it's John Williams. Uh, can I record this, please? I'd like, I can't stay on because I've got a hospital appointment, but am I able to record the meeting, please? Yeah, Dave's recording it as well, John. Sorry? Dave is recording it. Oh, is it? Is it? Can I do the same then? Yes, certainly. I just need permission from someone. Yeah, well, just do it, John. Sorry? Permission's been given to record it. Oh, has it? Yeah. It just says, please ask host to give you permission to record. Yes, I'm giving you permission. Oh, you're giving me permission. <laughs> I wish I could stay on, but I've got a hospital thing. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay, good luck, John. Oh, no, it's not doing it yet. 
<coughs> Carry on, Mike. Modern technology hiccups. Go on, Mike. Okay, any questions? I'll do a sh short, we'll do su short subtitles and then I'll ask questions. Because at your age, if I leave it too long, you'll forget what you wanted to ask. Okay? <laughs> right, fine. Anyway, about 1976, 77, we bought a 35-acre small holding. Because we had uh, three children and we had only lived in a two bedroom bungalow. And I wanted to get back to the land in a way. So we bought a 35 acre small holding in Shamwinyo, which is five miles north of Maitrim and Indian country. We were 700 feet up, but it was a lovely part of the world to live. Everybody was friendly. The, the S4C made a program about that parish, about the, what the influx of the English had on a very Welsh area. And it was very interesting. Anyway, on that 35 acres, as all I'd done was get a bit of a few store cattle and my father was farming a couple of miles away. So he more or less farmed it and use the building. But on that small holding, we went in for a couple of pigs. We reared pheasant. We had Muscovies walking all over the yard. And we had chicken. Also eventually had an aviary with canaries, finches, and doves in it, and Japanese quail, because I had a very long run, flight run for the birds. And me and our oh, and we had another Avery then for budgies. And we used to spend a happy hour in the morning having a cup of coffee, especially on a Sunday on a nice day, just listening to the canaries. And it was very peaceful out there, no cars or anything. And with the budgies, I had a double door to go in. And I'd bought a new budgie. And if somebody starts shouting at me in a minute, you know who it is. Because a neighbor who was interested in keeping birds as well. Maria went to show her the new budgie. So the idea is you go in through the first door and close it. Go in through the second door and close it. But nobody closed the first door. So this new budgie flew out. And I was going down the road to try to, well, you couldn't do anything. And eventually probably the wild birds would kill it anyway. But we had a lot of pleasure with keeping the birds, but it was, I must point out, we had to have a big flight area for them. And then again, closed space then for them to breed. And the trouble is with the doves, they're always laying their eggs on an angle, on a bunch of hay I put in the middle. We never bred from them. If I say the cage was wrapped in twill well, and that is what, half inch maximum square? And the Japanese quail were renowned for not laying their eggs in one place. And I was working 26 miles away with Eastwood in the factory at the time. So I came home one day and I thought we had rats. Instead of that, the quail had nested in one place and they'd hatched out. And we had about 20 of these little quail. And when I mean miniature quail, they were small. They got through the twill well and they were outside. And this must have been, what, late March? Anyway, there was a frost forecast. So I brought them in and I put them in a box by a raven in the kitchen. And we won't mention names, but somebody wasn't happy with that. So it was, they were put in the utility room. Anyway, we had to revive them in the morning because they got cold. So you learn by your mistake. But they were lovely animals and we had a lot of pleasure. With the ducks and the pheasants, well, the animals, they gave us a lot of pleasure, but the pig was Mar Marian's responsibility. And I did put a photograph of uh, Lucy with her 16 offspring on WhatsApp. It wasn't very good. But Marian stayed up all night to watch her farrow. 
I'm not to have the babies if you don't understand. Yeah, she was smoking in, that, in those days, so she had 40 cigarettes with her. And I made a board, so when Lucy was far away and pushing out the piglet, she picked the piglet up and put it on Lucy's teeth. But you had to keep the board between the head of the pig and yourself. Because we were uncertain how she would react with far away. Some pigs are a bit, can be a bit feisty, but Lucy was good as gold. So we had a lot of pleasure with the pigs as well. Marion says I've got a lot in common with them. As far as I'm concerned, they're intelligent and clean animals. Marian might say different, but I won't argue with her. All right, then. Come 1990, I was getting restless. We had looked to change jobs because I learned my trade and I was a manager at Eastwood for seven years. Hard work, very enjoyable, learned a lot. Went over to Denmark, looked at automatic machinery. The company had five processing plants in England and one in Scotland, in Glenrothes. So twice a month, you do, there's no dull where you went. So you learned a lot and you grew up fast. So we were looking to emigrate to uh, South Africa where there was a strong poultry industry, but we knocked that on the head and we moved into the 35 acre small over there. Had plenty of pleasure with the animals and the chickens and the ducks. And Marion was very interested in with the breeding of the ducks. <laughs> and she didn't know how it, how it worked out. So anyway, one day she was on, on the knees watching the drake. And my father happened to come up to check some cattle and she, he wondered what she was doing. And I won't, I won't go further on that because I want to survive after the day. Anyway. I was looking for another job in about 79, 80 to move on, do something different. And my father got uh, injured seriously by a bull. And he was, well, he was still around, but he was off color for three months. What happened? We had a heavy foot bull on the home farm. And it was a very slow walker. And my father used to walk the bull up about two miles up to our place put the bull in with the heifers up there. And the heifer is a maiden animal, about 18 months old. So he's encouraging the sheepdog to nip the heels of the bull to keep it going a bit faster. Anyway, in the winter, we used to put the tie of the bull in the cow shed, but the halter in the bull was quiet as a lamb. So my father was leading the bull into the cow shed now. Just going to tie it up, and the sheepdog shot in through the door and nipped the bull's heel. The bull shot forward and jammed my father against the wall. All the front of his chest and one arm were bruised. He was very lucky not to crush his ribs or be killed. So my Marian had told him I was going to look for another job, and then he asked me to come home. Uh, I hummed and hard because the farm wasn't going to be mine. And I got all the lousy jobs. I was sent up to England to milk when my uncle was on holiday. I was sent here, a couple of other places to milk when his friends wanted to go on holiday. If they were short of help on the hay, muggins here were sent. But uh, we used to go to the pub after, and I was never been a drinker, but I managed to stagger home a few times. Whatever time you came home at night, you were up half past five in the morning. You had no sympathy, you just got on with it. <clears throat> so I left Eastwards and I went home to work in 1980. And my father was milking about 110 cows and he went up to 150 cows. And he was farming about 230 acres plus my 35 acres. And with my brother there as well, and that's all I can say, we laid a heck of a lot of hedges, me and my father. My brother used to go and check the cattle, get the newspaper out of the pipe on the milk stand where the, Mr. Postman left it. And he'd spend uh, all the morning reading the paper and walking around checking the cow. So anyway, I stayed home for three years. And I thought, well, 
there's nothing here for me. So I announced one day I'm selling some window and I'm going to buy my, my own farm. Farm, Fanon Pedder, Peter Spring, between Latteston and Little Newcastle. It was 110 acres. It used to be a milking farm. There were no cubicles there, just a shed. And they used to milk the, um, at some time on a milking bale, which is more or less a mobile parlor. But that wasn't there. And the people I bought it off had 500 sheep on the premises. So I bought, uh, we bought the farm, um, borrowed a fair bit of money, had very little help from home. And we could, in those days, you could put different things in with the uh, in with the Ministry of Agriculture, and there were sort of grants and different systems on farming. It was a sheep farming system in Adonic, and I converted it to a dairy uh, system. So I applied then to keep 80 cows on the farm with the system, and then milk quarters came in, in 83, 84, uh, 1st of April, 84. I didn't have a milk quarter on the place. During the winter of 83, I converted the cow shed into an eight abreast milking parlor. And that's where you can milk eight cows at a time, a maximum of eight, but generally it was, if you're on your own, you had six units. And the cows would step up about 15 inches on a stand to be milked. It worked well. You know, we were down there then till 1990. Made a lot of mistakes. A lot of things to think about. But that's how you learn. And as my grandfather once told me, if you keep all your problems out of the house, you will survive. And he was quite right. You had your losses. And uh, at one moment, I had trouble carving a cow. And the vets were very, very good. And farming down Pembrokeshire there, it was like a big family. If you had a problem on Christmas Day, there was always some way where you could go to get your problem resolved. That sort of community it was. Anyway, the vet came out, phoned him up, problem with the cow. So he came out, he drove up in the yard. Next thing I know, he was under the car. His exhaust had gone through. So I shouted at him, Jeff, the cow's not under the car, it's in the shed. Well, I won't tell you what his reply was. But well, that's the sort of relationship you had. You know, it was always a bit of laughter, a bit of fun. But when it came to see into the job, it was serious. Anyway, carved the cow, no problem, and off we went. On that 110 acres, we kept about 75 cows. So it took me about two years to build up the cows, but before I get to them, I better go back to the milk quarter. To get, apply for a milk quarter, if you were milking before 84, 1st of April, you would have 90% of what milk you were producing then. I didn't have a uh, milk production record. So I had to apply for a special um, grant, and I had to go in front of a couple of committees, and I got Refused on two, and without a milk water, well, I'd have been finished. So the final one was a hardship water. And I had an interview in Kamar then at six o'clock. Or was it five o'clock? Anyway, I asked a very good friend who's in the National Farmers Union, Guy Williams, and he said he'll come with me. And they gave me a quarter for 80 cows, less 10%. And when I'm talking about the quarter, I'm on about, uh, if I work in gallons, do you understand what I mean? It's 5,000 gallons per cow. So if you had 80 cows, you were looking for 400,000 milk quarter. That's the cutbacks. So anyway, over the next two years, I bought an extra 100,000 milk quarter at 13 pence and 22 pence a litre. So off we went. I also bought 100 brokers, sheep. And when I mean brokers, they are sheep that are coming, the old age is coming up. 
And I tend to buy, if you're buying sheep and you're farming low, buy them from Santa Bother or on the upland. And when they come down, they'll do very well. If you buy lowland sheep and take them 700 feet up, they're not going to do so well because of the weather. They're not used to it. And a broker is a sheep. They used to give the hay to the sheep up there up behind neck in wire. And because they were chewing the wire and the hay half the time, they'd lose their teeth early. So perhaps they'd be a year, about a year younger than normal, what you call a broker. Because they lost their teeth. Once they lose their teeth, they're broker. And if uh, you, first thing you do when you check the, the sheep, you check the rudder that they're fine. The feet you can do something with. But if they got the odd tooth sticking up out of the odd jaw, out of the bottom jaw, that was a hindrance. So you took a pliers and just pulled the tooth out. Not a problem. And if Archie's listening, I did say that he had a problem with his teeth and I'd take it out for him, but he declined. But uh, anyway, we'd lamb the sheep then as close to Christmas as possible. I had two rams, 100 ewes, 75 head of cattle, and about 20 followers, 110 acres. We were doing quite well. I rented 10 acres from a neighbor, a bit of common land, a bit of rough land it was, but it worked for me. It was just down the road. And out of those 20, about 10 would be replacements for the dairy herd. But it would take you to, you carve down a heifer, which is a maiden heifer, at two or two and a half years old, depending on its size. So we carve them down, yes, we done all right. I end out all the mistakes, learned a lot. And then the, we had three sons. The eldest always went to go in the army. The middle boy had an interest on the farm, and the youngest, well, I thought he'd be an actor, but he's done very well for himself. He, well, he too went in the army, and now he's a major. Just six months okay, go, came back from Afghanistan, and thank God he has come back, the Taliban is kicking off. So he's done very well for himself. The eldest boy, after coming out of the army, you know, he's a heavy plant engineer, and he's done very well. The middle boy who had an interest in farm, he's working now in uh, maintenance, building maintenance, and he's done very well. So we're pleased with them. And the cap of the middle boy has got ligament trouble. They're fine. <coughs> Excuse me. So we were milking about 400,000 on that uh, farm in uh, uh, Little Newcastle. And there's one or two stories. They used to call me Mad Mike down there. I don't know why. But those hundred years, there was a communal dip in Little Newcastle. And I'd walk the sheep up there. And you had to turn left by the pub. And just a hundred yards down there, the dip was. So this year, I sent Andrew, who was about 14. I'd made arrangement with Dai Kote House, who was a very, he was farming in the village, lovely man, and always willing to help you or give you advice. We arranged now to go up, and Dai said, hey, you come up to me, one of us will stand in the road, turn the sheep left, and the other one would be in front of me. So off I went with the 100 years, and in those days, the traffic wasn't as bad as it is now. So came to the pub, there was nobody on the road. I had my sheepdog with me. I was shouting. Next thing I know, Dai Kote House and Andrew come out of the pub with a pint in their hands, smiling. So a few choice words were said. So I had to send the dog to get the sheep back, and then everything was fine. Once we dipped the sheep, you walked them home. Now, these are older sheep. When you dip them, they are heavy. So out of the hundred sheep, I'd get about 90 home. The others had collapsed on the side of the road for a rest. So I take the 90 home, connect the horse box to the tractor, go and fetch the other nine, the other 10. On fair play, there was quite a few holes in the horse box at that time, so they had to walk home in the end in the horse box. 
but we got away with it. The other little story I like to say down there, I got in the habit when I went to make a cross, I tie a bit of string from, let's say, a nettle on the hedge to a bit of grass the other side. So the cows then would turn left and then up the lane to be milked. On this occasion, I forgot to take the string down. And five minutes after I started milking, this man shot into the parlor and I had one heck of a bollocking of him. I left the string there and frightened the life out of him. He'd driven through it. No harm done. But I remember to take the string down after that. So we were coming now, the boys were getting older. We'd more or less have established, you know, I end out the problems in dairy and sheep, looking after young cattle. And so we thought, no, we'd better look for something bigger. On hindsight, I should have borrowed more money and bought a better farm to start with and expand it from there. But we're all clever on hindsight, so I was looking for another farm. So in 1990, I bought Trinethin Farm, Ponte de Lice, 235 acres. It had a 500,000 milk quarter on it when I bought it. And I took 300,000 with me to make 800,000 in total. So we were there then till I sold the place in 2004. Mariana Dale Health, and I'll come to that. Her and the bull didn't get on. I'll come to that. She was very, very lucky. Any questions? Oh, in 1984, I was getting 22 pence a litre for my milk. Okay, remember that. I'll come to that. Any questions, please? So Are you Mike, awake? Mike, when you, when you started, uh, you know, with the birds and all that, uh, did you know that there was a, a sufficient market to be able to sort of make, you know, enough money in, in sort of your aviary and your ducks and things like that? You know, where did that sort of come from? Well, the aviary was for, for pleasure, Paul. We, you know, we never made any money. We never looked to do any money out of that. The pheasants were for pleasure. And they went in the deep freeze. The Muscovy ducks, the Muscovy duck isn't as fat as the Aylesbury. And they're comical, and that gave us a lot of pleasure. And I used to put about 24 Muscovies in the deep freeze. And the story with that, because I was used to, shall we say, working in a poultry slaughterhouse, I had an arrangement with Marian. I'd see to as far as the fe feather in, and then Marian would clean them. But she never got around to cleaning them. And I was chasing her around the yard in San Guinio with this duck that I'd feathered, and the vicar called. And <laughs> so anyway, that was a laugh at the time. No, we done it for pleasure, Dave, uh, Paul. You know, there was, you know, the kids were growing up and we had our own little uh, hatchery incubator. You know, and see the chicks being uh, hatched out and the ducks. You know, the kids were growing up, they learned a lot. And to me, to a little fluffy duck is, uh, gives you a lot, lot of pleasure just to look at, and to see their antics. The pigs never made money on it, always broke even. But then to see the pigs, when they had a bit of a run, Marion used to look after them and clean them out. But the, uh, where the pigs laid in the shed, all, they'd never do their business anywhere near where they laid. It was either the, always the other side of the shed. So where they laid down was always clean and dry. And perhaps you'd have 16 of these piglets running around, and they're no different to human beings, children, you know, youngsters fighting, squabbling, running around, and all of a sudden, then the 16 would freeze for about five seconds. They'd all stop what they were doing, but then they start up again. So whether that's they heard or a sound, I don't know. But I'll tell you a story when we had the pigs in the old Kamarthen market. We took the, the pigs in as pokers. So they were oh, to the shoulder about two feet, say. Now our youngest, Alan, was about two foot six. And I, how old was he? He was only about four or five. 
So we'd put him in the pen with a brush to clean the pigs. And only his head was showing. And he had a smile from year to year. Because in the old market, they used to have a lot of holiday makers come. And they were all so fascinated with Alan being amongst the pigs, they were taking photographs all the time. And, you know, he had a smile all the time on that. He loved it. But his memories. Anything else? Mike, did you make much money on the, on the sheep, you know, with the shearing? And then the, the meat was, a, did you have to pay for the shearers to come or did you make yeah. any money on that? We paid, we paid for a shearer to come, John. Um, I never had a strong back. I damaged it when I was 16, trying to start the cold concrete mixer in January. And um, yeah, we sheared them. Two used to come. Well, one used to come. I'd catch him, he'd cheer them, and then me and Mary, and then we'd roll the wool up. You would, you never made big money on wool, John. Yeah, you know, it would pay your cost, and perhaps you'd have a pint at the end of it. But with the sheep, yes, they paid very well. Because we were lambing early, and I had two Suffolk rams, and we tried to lamb in Christmas time, and then they'd be gone for Easter, because I didn't have the ground to keep to, to lamb late. The cows had priority. So if you could get 95% away by Easter, um, you know, you had a chance then to lock out the silage fields and extra grass for the cows. And I'll tell you a story there. I used to send the lambs to Cardigan Market. But the problem I had, uh, I had a, a Land Rover and a horse park. I'd have to put uh, two cushions under the seat of the Land Rover and two behind. No, sorry, two cushions behind the Land Rover driver. Nothing on the seat, so she could reach the pedals. And we'd sort the lambs out to go to market, because you came, you know, you only had to pick them up. You knew the weight was right, 80 pounds. You put your hand on their back, you knew the other confirmation. You would mark, say, 10 or 12 lambs to go to market for Monday. So about five o'clock in the morning then, I'd bring the sheep up through a track that was fenced off, put gates across and pull the lambs out. Well, somebody was in charge of the driving, supposed to open the door of the Land Rover. I put the lamb in and she's supposed to close it quick without taking your fingers off. Well, there was once or twice where she was too close, slow closing the door and I ended up running down the road after the blinking lamb. Well, there's one thing for sure, boys, if you couldn't see us, you'd hear us. But uh, it was fun. I'd send Marion then to the Cardigan Market, tell her to go around Fishcut Way on the main road. And it, I'd notify the drove, you know, I knew the drovers on Cardigan Market. You tell them the wife's coming in, she'll park, and you reverse the land rover and offload, please. No problem at all. If your lambs went in fairly early, they were sold fairly early and you'd have the better price, I thought, which was more or less, right? And then man Maria would come back and I'd be milk, I'd be finished milking by then. It was all a family, everybody worked together. And while we were down Pembrokeshire, I'll tell you a little story. Marion unfortunately had a bit of she had to go into hospital two or three times. And anybody who knows me knows I don't like waste. So anyway, Marion was in hospital. I'd start milking, stop, make sure the boys are washed clean. And anyway, on this occasion, they had a boiled eggs for breakfast. And they'd catch the bus. The yard of the farm was up by the side of the road. So they only walked to the end of the, you know, it wasn't far for them to catch the bus. So when I finished my job, so I'd go in, have breakfast, and I'd make cowl. And put the cowl on the raven so it'd simmer all day. So there was, this was in the winter. Because so they had something hot to eat when they came home. And their mother used to phone up to see how they were and talk to them in the evening. They moaned about having cow every night. But they ate it all. Anyway, on this occasion, there was a boiled egg left over in the morning. So I thought, what am I going to do to this? I don't want it. So I put it in the cow. You know, and even got them. That night, you know what happened? The, the thinking egg came out whole. And I have it. And they moaned to their mother. Another occasion, it was in the summer, and I had my garden, so I made a ham salad for the boys when they came home from school. 
Now, when Aunt Arlene was the youngest, he must have been about nine then. And he made a lovely ham salad. He was saying, he was just going to put it in in the mouth, and he noticed it's going to look nicely. Well, I had it over that as well, and I had it off their mother. But as I said, it doesn't do the birds any harm to eat the caterpillars. They like them. You get the boys together now, and somebody mentions it's food. The blinking egg and the caterpillar comes out every time. Remember when, Dad? Remember when, Dad? Anyway, anything else, boys? Yes, the sheep ate well, John. And well, I'll tell you one thing about the sheep. When the lambs went to market fat, the ewes went to market as well. I couldn't afford to carry 100 uh, ewes on the farm during the summer. I didn't have the ground. So then I'd replace them then in the beginning of August, buy fresh lot in and do the same again. Okay. Anything else? No? Right. <clears throat> So we moved up to Trinidad in 1990. Uh, Marion went up on a Friday. I took the young cattle up, but then I came back, carried on milking, and the cows went up on the Monday. And I was very fortunate to have very good friends and neighbours. There must have been about 16 of us here loading up a double-decker lorry with all the milking cows and everything else. And I'd made a few journeys on tractor and trailer from Pembrokeshire up to Pontevedra as well. So it worked all right, but it was very tiring. Uh, the farm we bought had been run down. I went to milk and then I found the unwashed out. The chap I bought it off, unwashed out. He was a dirty so and so. And that was the milking parlor. So I had to strip the whole parlor that evening before I could milk. So we weren't very pleased, but the friend stayed on that night. He stayed with us at 12 me in the morning. And the parlor I had got in the new farm was a 1212 herringbone, which has a pit in it. You are in the pit milking and the cow just walk more or less stomach height. So you can milk 12 cows, uh, six cows each side. So you can milk 12 cows at a time, that's a 1212 herringbone. And the cows weren't used to it. But with me, if I want a cow to go from A and B, it goes from A and B. There's no argument, and that's the end of it. The first milking was tough. Ty, my friend who had stayed with me, they gave me a hand to milk that night. He kept saying, are you all right? Are you all right? I said, why, what's wrong? He said, well, that cow just kicked you hard. You know what, you were such a, on such a high, because you had a slight slope into the parlor and the cows weren't used to it. So they were very hesitant, so you were pushing them. But you didn't notice it, you carried on. For half past nine that night, when I was in the house, you could have bought the farm for a five pound note. Mm -hmm. But after that, the following day, 90% of the cows walked in, no problem at all. By the third milking, it was normal. So that was fine. So we ended up with 140 milking cows on that farm. I got rid of the sheep. It was, the farm was poorly fenced, poorly run. Messy. So I knew all the sheep by their back ends. So I thought, right, time to get rid of the sheep. And I bought extra cows. And in about, what is it, nearly four years, I had under 40 cows, 20 replacements. And those are Frisian heifers or whatever I was breeding to replace the milking cows. And also we had 60 other store cattle. And I'll come to that later on. Any questions? Yes, can I ask a question? Um, yes. Did you have a faithful dog helping you all this time? Yes. Um, unfortunately, the dog was very good, but I put rat and poison, poison down and I killed him, killed her. Oh. And I don't know how she got access to it, as you said, um, since that day, I was, I've been very, very careful with rat poison. And I've made sure there's concrete blocks and everything else. So if the rat pulls it out, you check it every morning and night when you get up or before you go to bed to make sure there's no poison being pulled out. 
That's what must have been happened. The rat had pulled the poison out and the dog ate it. And then I bought another dog. I normally have bitches. And this dog was um, useless. And when we went up to Tanathin, it was wandering into a next door neighbor. I won't mention names, but he wasn't farming. He was in uh, barren cows and slaughtering, and we had the slaughterers in Gowan. And he shot my dog. Mm. And it, was, it wasn't any good, but I didn't like that. I won't tell you what I've done. We'll move on. Mike, can um, I ask you, uh, where, where, where were you, or which farm were you at, and where were you at when we had all that foot and mouth? Do you remember all that? And there were pets? Yes, and... yes. okay, we'll move on to the right. That was, we moved up in 1990. Then you had BSE come in, Matt Cowell disease. If I talk about warble flies, do you know what I'm talking about? No. These warble flies would land on the back of a cow, they would lay their egg into the skin. That egg then would come out like a caterpillar and pour down into the, the back of the animal. So when that animal went for slaughter, the, um, shall we say the skin of the animal wasn't much good for leather work. So the industry was losing money. But so many of the carcasses couldn't, the, the skins of the animals couldn't be used for leather. But there were too many holes in them, only, you know, not the full hit skin. And as children, we had a lot of pop fun. When the wobble fight larvae got ripe, it was like a pimple on your face and the white bit, and then you'd pop it. Well, you could, when it was ripe, you'd squeeze it and it'd shoot out. So as kids, we used to do that. And the last warble fly I saw was in, what, in 87, 88. And the cows were ready. I brought them up to the main road. I was just walking up to send them to open the gate and get them across the road. When they were all the heads went up in the air and they were restless. And I could see this warble fly. It was bigger than a bee, making an a noise. So they came out with a dressing then that you poured on the back of the cows along the spine, right up to the top of the head. And BSE, and what I'm telling you is my own opinion, right? I reckon that fly killer got into the spinal cord, into the nervous system, infected the brain of the cow. Nothing was ever said about it. And in, 19, in the, about 91, I had, one definite case of BSE, she was a twin. The, the other twin was fine. But this cow, if you put your hand anywhere near her head, she would go bonkers. And you had to be very, very careful when you milked her, because she'd let fly. And the other case was 50-50. But my theory is that, that pesticide on their back got into the nervous cord system. Well, Ben would probably know what I'm talking about, but the, it was absorbed into the carcass of the cow when you put it along the spinal cord. Then we had foot and mouth. Um, I didn't, uh, we didn't have a problem ourselves, but everything was on lockdown. You couldn't move cattle. And I had a friend, I shouldn't be telling you this either. We had a friend who um, had a few settlers and he'd lost a calf. And I had some good, uh, I had an MRI bull there then, I had some very good calves from it. Too big in actual fact. And that's another story. So I decided, I phoned up the Ministry of Ag as well, a neighbour wanted to buy some cattle of me. And I said, look, that's all I've got to do is make an entrance through this hedge, from my field to his field, and walk the cattle through. Can I do it? They said, no. I thought it was ridiculous. But anyway, I'd done a bit of a naughty, my friend in Sandarog, he wanted this bull calf and uh, it was about 250 pound cash. I put it in the boot of the car. I put it in a sack with his head out of the sack. And Ben will remember when we would take calves into market in the old day, he put the back end of the calf into the sack and he tied the sack tight around his neck so on his head was showing. So anyway, I was on the motorway, went up the motorway. The next thing I know, this blinking calf's head shot out through the, the top of the back seat. 
with his head on, and you could see it from the back window. I thought, oh, I think I'm in a bit of trouble here, so please see me. I shot up the back road and I had my 250 pounds. I shouldn't have told you. <laughs> That. But the foot and mouth, well, there is a theory that it's an experimental lab in Salisbury. And I was told a couple of years back, and somebody I know was in, shall we say, the intelligence side of the army. And he said the foot and mouth came out of Salisbury by mistake. But this is my own feeling. And the same as this wahoo, this uh, seer coronavirus. It escaped from the experimental lab that they got there in China from the same place where he already did. Right? Anything else, boys? <clears throat> Any questions? No, let's move on. So it's 235, at 800,000 milk water, no sheep. We were doing all right. With the milking uh, cows, there's three systems of, milk, of dairy. In. One is they call the New Zealand style. And that's a smaller animal and you get all your milk, 95% of your milk out of grass. They're smaller animals and they're on out at grass, shall we say, nine months of the year. It depends on the weather, but you keep them out as long as possible. And the only cake, and when I may talk about cake, is bought in feed. They'll get about four, four pounds every milk kit. The yield out of these animals will be four to 5,000 gallons or 20 to 25,000 liters, just to round it up, right? Low input, low output, but you increase the numbers. And by increasing the numbers, you've got to remember every cow has four feet. And if you've got a hundred cows, it's 400 feet going through a gateway. Right, so you can make a mess. So you've got to get the system right. But that's very popular and they tend to block calves. When I talk about block calving, they dry the, the, the cow milks for nine or uh, 10 months out of every 12. In theory, the ideal is to get the cow in calf and get one calf every 12 months. So they milk high for three months, they back in calf, then the milk starts going down. So when it comes to about a couple of gallons a day, you can dry them off, you know, or less than that, preferably less than that. So they have two months rest before they carve again. So a lot of the New Zealand system in this country, they will stop milking, dry everything off in December. So they got December and January dry, and then they start carving in February, and your best feed is young grass with a high protein, high protein, and, the, and you maximize the use of the grass. That's what that system is. Low input, low output. The system we, well, I used, I carved all the year round. One, I had high borrowings at the time, while the cash flow had to be right. And then the industry was penalizing you the buyers were for producing a lot of milk in April, May, and June, because they wanted a flat trajectory of milk production in this country. So it was easier for them to forecast what milk was coming in and where they could sell it to. Talking about that brings you on to the milk marketing board. The milk marketing board took over buying the milk off the farmers in the 50s in this country. They set the price. And that was negotiated between, shall we say, good farmers, medium farmers, and poor farmers. And they and the milk lorry used to come, he used to come down the road and pick every farm up on that road. The, this has been the demise of dairy in this country. In 1991, the milk marketing board was abolished. There was a lot of pressure from the processing plants and the milk uh, factories that they didn't have a say in the price of milk. The supermarkets in the 80s started getting stronger. By the 90s, they had very, very strong buying power. And if you look at the price of milk, milk has always been a loss leader in the, in the supermarkets. It's always the far side of the supermarket. 
and milk today, what do you pay in pound a liter for semi skim? You know, we're having 22 and a half pence in 1984. The milk price today is anywhere between 25 and 33 pence a litre. We, the farmers have got no say. It's one heck of a job to get all farmers to pull together. You can't expect the National Farmers Union to represent pigs, sheep, beef, dairy, and arable horticulture. Because there's some conflicting areas there. But the farmers can't get together. And this is a, a good story. But anyway, um, I was chairman of the milk committee. We formed 35 farmers, but we were looking somewhere now to buy our milk. And the only get in Swansea we went to. And uh, used to go to the meetings up uh, Wiltshire. And uh, that's where I met Michael Levis, got to know him well, the Glastonbury Pop Festival. And he done a lot of good for his farming area. He bought houses for people so they were uh, first time buyers. He'd sell them to them and to help the area and his party. But he was a very nice man. Anyway, I'm digressing. I can't remember where I was, no. <clears throat> so anyway, yes, I know. That was the, um, I was carving all the year round. Um, as I said, they took, they started penalizing you then. This was after the, uh, the MMP was demolished in 91. We went to Unigate. Then we were saying, right, they wanted the farms to have a good profile. It was a food industry. Put daffodils in your drives, get your rubbish around the back of the site. Because there's nothing worse than driving down the motorway, looking at the backs of farms, front of farms, and they're a mess. At the end of the day, you're a custodian for the, the land, the wildlife, the waterways, and you're a food producing place. And I'll tell you a little story about that. You only get to sell in their milk to the Tesco's. The Tesco's, I had a visit from Tesco's to look at the parlor and the setup and the hygiene. And I got a couple of trophies here for five years. At the time, we, had, uh, we, had, we were in Bandi and hygiene. And in um, quality of milk, and that's good protein and fat. And what, we went into the supermarket, and I could see cobwebs hanging from one of their sides. And this chap who visited me from Tesco, he was a bit of a pain. I had swallows in the milk in parlor. What are you doing about it? So I told him, look, I put signs up in South Africa, Swahili. English and Welsh, and the swallows are still coming. What do you want me to do? I couldn't stop them. So anyway, Tesco's had cobwebs from their side. So I said, I want to see the manager, please. So I couldn't see him. I saw the under manager. Marianne had run by now. She got them. So I said, look, I've been, in, I've been inspected by your hygiene people. I come to a supermarket selling food and you got cobwebs hanging from the sign in the supermarket. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come back in a week's time. If those cobwebs are there, I'll sit and see the environmental health. What's good for you is good for me as well. So anyway, for Marianne, I've gone to my... So that's, I don't know where I'm going. I can all track you. Any questions? <clears throat> no, right. I can't even have a drink. Um, so anyway, the system of calving all the year round, the cows were in five to six months in the winter, where the New Zealand system in, they were probably only in four months, depending on weather again and grass growth. But the system I was on, you'd be getting uh, 32 to 40,000 litres out of the cow, seven or 8,000 gallons a year. You will feed in twice as much cake and, and bought in feed. But it was important to get your silage, your feed right, your feed systems right. Animals want stability. Their housing has got to be clean, dry, and hygienic as best as possible, with a good airflow without a draft. 
If you've got cobwebs hanging from a roof, you've got a poor airflow. And John and a few others, I walked the farm down my dream with a very good friend. I'd done a lot of work down there with him. And I explained this to the shed set up for any keeping animal. But stability, and if you've got a very, very good routine, you've got your feeding system right, no hassle for doing no extra work, you'd, you'd get increase your profit margin by 5% by doing no extra work, but getting it right. The third system is high pedigree or pedigree animals. Now, these are bigger animals. They took, a, they, because they are pedigree, and you people have got dogs and cats and are breeding and all that pedigree side, there's two men. If you go back 30 years, you'll find the bulls from these animals more or less came from a small handful of sorts. So the longer you're breeding down that line, the weaker the animal gets. I was milking for over five, six years after I sold the farm for a friend up in Penamani, the other side of Kusara. And he had very good pedigree cattle. But the yard was on a bit of a slope at times. And if they were bullying, and if you know, you know what I mean by bullying coming into season, one cow would ride the other. Of course, one of, the, one of them fell, they'd have a job to get them. So I was more or less on the cross-fed cross animal because we had a lot of slopes, a lot of walks, and I wanted a strong leg. So these were bigger animals. You fed them a lot more. You were feeding more or less 12 to 16 or 18 pounds of cake a day. A lot of bought in feed, but you were having a 50 to 80,000 yield from them of liters. They, you know, something between eight and 10, 11,000. But they took a lot of looking after, a lot of model coddling. And I bought a cow from Cardigan. So, and she was, oh, she was a lovely cow, fourth carbon. And if you can get seven or eight uh, calves out of a cow, you've done well. And the boys called her Dopey. And that was unfair because she wasn't dopey. She was just a lovely, lovely animal. And they take her in turns to ride her back from the collecting yard out to the field. That's how quiet she was. And she was a lovely cow. She milked well for me. But there we are. So those are the three milk systems. And another thing, while I was down Pembrokeshire, we had um, neighbours, Di and Bloodwin. And I'll move on from then. The time's going on. Anyway, they were good neighbours, and every Sunday they'd go for a little run in the car. <clears throat> but on this Sunday, they had a very, very big row between the two of them. So they had the dinner, nobody was speaking. They still went for a run, and they went down the back country roads quietly for half an hour, and they came across a shed, an open-sided shed, full of goats, pigs, and donkeys. And Bloodwen turned to Di and said, Di, relations of yours? Yes, said Di, in-laws. Anyway, any questions? I think, Michael, five minutes. We, we're up, the hour's up. I'm only part of a way through, John. Yes, I understand. Okay, I think, yeah, time for questions okay. now, I think. Okay. Just a quick one, the working hours, a normal day, you'd be up half past five, you'd work through. I always had an hour off for lunch, unless we were on, even on the silage. I was an hour off, and 20 minutes of that was asleep. Normal time finishing about half past seven. In the winter, it was a bit easier because you didn't have to fetch the cows, they were in two. Sure. Um, in the spring, that was the height of the busiest time for me. Because you have to uh, put fertilizer out, chain, harrow, and roll, and try to get it all finished by the first end of the first week of April. And 10 o'clock was my cutoff time, irrespective of what happened. During all this, you had 140 cows to calve, and 65% will calve from 9 o'clock in the evening to 6 o'clock in the morning. So you always were up with them. In the summer, get your first crop of silage in, and you could relax. 
We done three cuts of silage, 120 acres, 100 acres, and 40 acres the third cut. I ran out of silage once, and I vowed never to run out again. But it was a good life. Um, health and safety, there's a lot to be said on this. Well, I shouldn't tell you this either, but I used to buy bulls at 12 months old. The worst bulls are Jersey and short on and Anyway, I bought a short on bull. And we were moving it from one field to the cows where the cow wouldn't stand the AI. Halfway across the field, the bull went bonkers. He had a bit of a spirit on him. But at 12 months old, I put the vet would put a ring in its nose. I, I, when it is healed then, I'd put a rope through it and I'd hit the bull hard on its nose twice with my stick. Never touched it up to that. Halfway through the field, taking this bull to the cows, the bull went ballistic. He was snorting, rushing at me, stopping, pouring the ground and making one heck of a noise. So I thought, oh dear, I'm in trouble, yeah? No words to that effect. <laughs> the son was with me and he was, what, 15, 16. So I told Andrew, look, I'll distract the bull. You get out, toss to the gate, into the collecting yard, out of the way, and whatever happens, you don't leave there. So he, he legged it. I was jumping up and down, shouting and waving the stick. And I thought, I'm in trouble. I can't outrun them. And if he comes straight for me, I'm finished. But I reckon he didn't come for me because I had the stick up in the air and he'd been, he knew what would happen if I got close to it. So I think that saved me. But then, thank goodness, he smelt the cows and he ran to the cows and threw. And uh, he was in the lorry, the first lorry on the farm he'd gone. Got an MRI bull, and Marion unfortunately got caught by this bull. Knocked her down, butted her for about 20 yards, and thank goodness it was a slope because every time he was, she was he was she was being butted, she was being pushed. An electrician, our electrician friend had called because they had a problem in the parlor. And as soon as the bull saw him, he turned around and ran up. I was taking the cows up. And I'm in front of the cows, dog behind. So I didn't know what had happened. But Marion was very fortunate she could have been killed. On health and safety on the farm, I can name three children who have been killed. The father's run, run over one, another father smothered one in the silage because they went to look for their father and he didn't see him. And the third, I told you about putting string across the road. This 11 year old, he's only a quarter of a mile away from it, was coming tearing down this track in the Father forgot to take the string down, but he tied it on branches of trees and it caught the boy and crossed the neck and broke his neck. And I don't know how they can live with that, but farming was high accident. You know, it's in the top three for accidents in the country. Any question? So we're coming to the end. I think, Mike, we yeah. ought to probably. As interesting as all this is, and as humorous as it's been this afternoon, I think we need to almost call this a day. Um, That's right, we do, Dave. But uh, I'm halfway through. <laughs> we, we do thank you for it. If everyone would like to unmute, then you could ask some final questions before we depart. But you need to unmute yourselves. Yeah. So, Michael. Thank you very much for uh, talking to us this afternoon. Yep. Uh, we greatly appreciate um, what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I, I would like, at some time, I'll do another, but I want to talk about any well welfare. Yeah. Like that, because as if I'm watching your food. One quick one. Watching your food. You all eat bacon, I presume. Yes. Right, next time you get bacon out, put two slices in a bowl, put boiling water on them, just cover them, that's all, and swill the bowl around for 10, 15 seconds. Take the bacon out, and then have a look what colour the water is. And that is what's in your food. And Thank you for that, Michael. I might not have bacon ever again. <laughs> <laughs> So that would be a shame. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for coming. You want cheap food, but it's... <laughs> I quite agree. 
<laughs> you get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, David. Um, our monthly lecture next uh, month is uh, Lorraine Cox, Life in France. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all, and I will send out a, a Zoom link in due course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.